perfect. Um, anyways, I obviously this is uh, the talk that I was planning at CCS, so uh, you're all on the surgical side of things. So I, I thought I would start with a case example. Um, so 61 year old woman, um, non STEMI with left main stenosis. I'm purposely showing you a terrible image, but you'll make, <laughs> I want you to make a judgment call. So past medical history is the EF is a little bit low and I'll show you a little more later. Uh, she has pretty bad lung disease, COPD and diabetic and also morbidly obese. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, what's your recommendation? Surgery, PCI, or I'm not sure. So again, go back to the criteria, young lady or youngish patient. Any thoughts? Surgery, everybody's going to be very quiet. Surgery, PCI, not sure. I normally I'd have a poll, but I don't have a poll. So presumably many of you would likely say surgery. Probably not many of you would say PCI. And there'd be some that'd be not sure wanting more information. Anyways, that's probably not an unreasonable because I'm purposely not showing you too much here. Um, so the important problem that we sometimes face is that, you know, the opinions around left main is often, you know, quite strong and often non-nuanced. And, and hopefully I can bring a little bit of nuance to the, to the, to the discussion because I, I really think that there are things that, that are open and that we can actually learn from and discuss. And this is the kind of editorial that you might see. Uh, and this was an editorial that came out in Jack, um, or sorry, JHA, uh, is percutaneous cornea intervention now the default revascularization strategy for unprotected left main? You know, so these are the kinds of inflammatory things that you might see around and it tends to make people, at least on the surgical side, a little bit nervous, but tends to, to, to have a particular target audience and, and we should all be careful a little bit and I think the reality is that left main revascularization questions are not new, but they are driven over time by limited information. And this is a classic one that we tend not to speak too much about, but the Le Mans trial uh, looked at 10 year data of a trial comparing PCI for left main versus surgery. And this is what the end of that trial showed or en ended up suggesting is while stenting offered numerically but statistically not significant favorable long-term outcome at 10 years, therefore constitute an alternative therapy to, uh, to cabbage surgery. So, so you can see how, you know, these kinds of information can, and this was in Jack, you know, intervention in 2016, it's not that long ago, is within the past 10 years, sort of fuels a little bit of that, that sense. And, and to be honest, you know, we're, we obviously work in this every day. We tend to follow this literature quite a bit, but not every clinician follows this. The interventional guys do, we do, but the clinical cardiologists, some do and some don't. And, you know, there's a variability out there. Um, anyways, um, whoop, maybe I can. So if you look more globally at mortality in general, there's no doubt that if you compare in the upper part here, these are randomized studies. And these are match studies, some of the largest study. Um, and you can see that the early results of RCT versus match study, in general, if you look at mortality alone, whether you favor PCR or favor cabbage, and I'll, I'll point out that as I show down the slides, I'll, I'll highlight where favoring cabbage versus PCI is because it tends to flip from one side of the chart to the other. So that's important to pay attention. But there's not a lot of difference between the two. But again, you're focused on mortality only in the early setting. So what it only means is that potentially the approaches are reasonably safe in the short term. So that's something to think about. Um, so overall, they appear not very different. But if you looked at other things in the first and early, what I mean by early is in the first months or year. Um, when you look at major adverse events, though, it tends to always favor coronary vascularization or cabbage over PCI. And largely because major adverse events are, are, are driven by repeat revascularization or other things that tend to happen to these patients over time. So whether you look in the randomized size, side or you look in the match study, in the match study, it's even more dramatic, the effect. There is a statistically significant trend or, or appearance if you pull the data that favors cabbage or PCI. And that's generally not very debated. And I think most would agree with these things. So when you come to left main specific, so these are the big trials that at least have some component of left main 
as part of the study question or part of the randomization. And study syntax, pre-combat, and more recently in the Excel and the Novo. And, and these are, are listed here, and I'll show you a little bit of the data around them. And the, the largest trial is really the Excel trial, which compared PCI versus cabbage for left main and left main stenosis of 70 or 50, if it was shown to be immunodynamically significant, is really the one that's important to think about. Um, and more importantly, it tended to look at patients. The reason I highlighted here the syntax score, uh, it does eliminate patients um, um, you know, for, for exclusion criteria that tend to have the worst kind of disease, which tends to be the patient that you would see in surgery rather than thinking about, should is this someone we could do PCI versus cabbage? So this area, this group here lists the sort of exclusion criteria. So the high syntax score were eliminated or excluded from that trial. So these were lower syntax score patient. And even in that lower syntax score patient, there was some important lesson to learn from that randomization. In the syntax study itself, uh, it wasn't designed to look specifically at uh, left main, but left main was a sub-analysis of which there were around 300 or so patients between the two. So how did it look in the end? So when you look at, again, these trials, specifically looking in the early all-cause mortality, um, uh, there is generally uh, the overall aggregate of all these studies was that there's not significantly a difference between cabbage and PCI, except for the Excel trial. And the Excel trial did appear to show a survival advantage even early on. Um, and so, so the, sorry, not early on at five years. And this is important because this was the first trial, whoops, this was the first trial that was able to show uh, that if you followed patients long enough, you were able to show a survival difference compared to the early data that I showed you earlier. And again, if you look at MACE, is most of these studies, if you look at newer generation drug eluding stents, which are Excel and Noble, there was a favoring towards cabbage over PCI, again, in the newer and more dramatically than in the other ones. But again, these are five-year data. So if you follow these patients long enough, there will have more adverse events over time. So in the end, if you look specifically at myocardial infarction, again, myocardial infarction favored cabbage as a significant reduction, and it favored any type of repeat revascularization. So to summarize all of that data, early on mortality may not be that different. There likely is some MACE benefit early on favoring cabbage. But if you go on to further over time, specifically looking at trials that compare specifically left main, especially the Excel trial, there is a survival advantage that's all cause mortality. And that is associated also with lower MACE, lower myocardial infarction, and any repeat revascularization. And so it's important to look at specifically at the curves a little bit. If you look at any mortality, is that that took time to occur. So the first year and two year result were not that dramatic, but the curves continue to split over time. And so that at five years, there's clearly a separation of those two curves with an odds ratio of 1.38, favoring cabbage over PCI for all cause death. It's also worth noting, if you look at the other outcomes, how they crossed over early on in the first year, which was important to see and how they continue to increase over time, whether you look at different comp composite, whether it's a composite of dead stroke microinfarction or dead stroke microinfarction, ischemia driven vascularization. Generally, most of these things favored cabbage over time. And that difference appeared to increase over time, favoring cabbage over PCI. So this is why the guidelines led to this. And these are the most recent guidelines here from the ACC. And, uh, and some of that data, you know, it's, it's clear from the old trials that left main stenosis is a class one recommendation for revascularization, where it becomes a little bit harder and sometimes you need to have discussions and where the heart team is very important is around in selected patients and this is where the wording is a little funny, you know, with stable ischemic heart disease and significant left main in whom PCI is believed to provide an equivalent revascularization possible with cabbage, then PCI might 
be reasonable. So again, it's a two-way indication. As um, Subodh talked earlier, um, it's obviously not a 2B here, but this is where some of these things vary. And this is where the next one, 2B, is in when you add other things like diabetes, then it becomes a 2B indication. So you have to be a little bit careful when you, you have these discussions with your colleagues. And these are unstable ischemic heart disease. They may not be in a patient who's having chest pain on the table. They're not considered stable then. So these are the discussions you need to be having. And, and I think as I go further along, you know, there are important aspects to think about. But if you truly have somebody who's stable in front of you and you have a discussion and you want to, you know, you have an argument of well, all the mortality is pretty similar between X and, you know, what I'm doing and what you're doing. At the end of the day, this is a class one indication for surgery. It's not a 2A or 2B. There is a major difference. It is well supported by evidence. Um, and there are some nuances that hopefully we'll go through in a few minutes. So the algorithm that tend to sort of evolve over time look a little more like this in reality. Um, it's interesting when I see this algorithm because you know we tend to think of left main as more than 50%, um, but the, not all left mains of 50% are the same, uh, as you know. Um, and uh, it's interesting how this one has developed that you know in, in the ones that are angiographically between the 50 and 69, an FFR or an IVUS is used to really determine whether it is significant or not. And it really highlights the point here when you're not certain about a left main is really making sure that it is truly significant. Um, and then revascularization, you know, a heart team discussion is important and it's assessing the overall operative risk. So if you have a non-favorable factor in terms of operability, whether it's very advanced age, frailty, hostile chest, you know, cognitive status, those kinds of things, then obviously PCI may be something to consider from that point of view. When it becomes a little bit more complicated here is this is the way the algorithm and many of your colleagues may want to have or push that algorithm. Again, trying to simplify things a little bit is it's, 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 it's really taking the guidelines a little far in my mind because the reality is you're trying to equate class one versus class two A indications and simply using another form or way to help you decide around, well, if the burden of coronary disease is very high, then obviously cabbage makes sense. If the burden is really low, then, then cabbage or PCI may be equivalent, but they're not really equivalent. Because if you look at the long-term survival and you look at other things, they're not. But again, it's, it's really trying to make sure that you can argue all of these things. We make these clinical decisions every day. And there's many a times that you're, you're very willing to think, well, that patient is a pretty high risk patient. My colleague doing PCI can do a good job and result in a very good outcome here. That is a reasonable option in this patient. It's really going back to the patient and trying to evaluate that individual to make the best decision. Because obviously the low intermediate uh, syntax score is a judgment call in terms of the best approach for these patients. Uh, and my sense is you're trying to equate things that may not be equivalent. So uh, I did cross out in this slide. This is a slide that tries to weigh in the risks, the benefits, comparing PCI on the left versus cabbage and trying to what favors one approach versus the other and where the heart team is particularly helpful. But the reality is I, I crossed out the similar mortality because the reality is it does not offer similar mortality. If anything, cabbage offers a survival advantage. And again, you have to remind yourself of those things. If you think that patient is a reasonable risk, then remember that what you're offering will offer a survival advantage, and you need to remind your colleagues of that. But in a high-risk patient, in the early phase of things, when they have lots of other things that can affect their survival, the mortality is not that different early on between the two approaches. Uh, so looking at, at, at these two aspects, you clearly look at, you know, there are factors that would favor surgery and all of these things we all know is the diffuseness of disease, the extent of coronary disease, long-standing diabetes, ejection fraction that's low. It's funny though how ejection fraction that's low has tended to equate sometimes as you know any EF that's low is reasonable. Well between you and me an EF of five or eight percent in somebody who barely is alive is not necessarily an indication for surgery in that setting. It is it's interesting how they may not be willing to do PCI in those patients because they think they're too high risk. 
well, between you and me, sometimes it's a little bit risky from a cardiac surgical point of view too, especially in an elderly patient. So you have to weigh in again, all of these aspects. Um, and the syntax score is a little bit of a, of a conundrum because most places tend not to measure the syntax score. We all have a sense of what diffuse coronary disease looks like and what, um, you know, when it's quite high versus when it's low. Uh, so again, something to, to imagine. So going back to that patient, I, I just thought I would show you what, what that ventricle looked like. Um, and, uh, you know, just the fact that it takes that long to fill that ventricle. So that EF is not 20%. It is not great. So morbidly obese, not that old a patient, FEV1 of less than one liter with chronic COPD and a low EF was not a great with a particularly nasty anatomy. No doubt this patient would, you would want to revascularize if you can. And, and what I, I'm trying to sort of uh, get you guys to think is, is rather than, than think of your colleague from the interventional side, who's not particularly think, doesn't think particularly that this is appetizing either, and neither do you as a surgeon necessarily want, but you want to help this person going forward so this is what we ended up doing. So, uh, and I'll show you what we did, but what do you do now? So what would you recommend? Surgery, PCI, or mechanically assisted PCI? So uh, I'm obviously leading all of you guys into a particular trajectory. Um, so it's a little bit unfair to ask. So it would have been more fun with, with a survey. Um, but anyways, uh, so this is what we ended up doing. Um, I don't know if I can, hopefully I can make this play. Oh, it does play. So, you know, we ended up doing mechanically assisted ECMO supported PCI. And, and I'll show you our experience. You know, there'll be lots of people who are poo poo the approach of ECMO in this setting. But to be honest, we do this awake. We do this entirely percutaneous, all pro glide closure at the end. And the patient, you know, is not hard for wear after we decannulate right at the end of the procedure because they're done in a patient that we think is optimized at that time. So awake, per peripheral percutaneous cannulation, use a very small arterial, 25 of French venous, and a PCI is done. And is, you know, the patient can be discharged a couple of days after. So there are ways. So we've tended to approach this more as a collaborative manner. We both know this is a high risk scenario. The question is, which approach do we think is gonna be the lowest risk in that patient? And this is the result in that particular patient. You know my colleagues can do amazing things with stents. And particularly if you support the patient, you know, they use IVL, they also use all sorts of calcium modifying techniques to try to get the best result they can. They IVIS every single thing. And, you know, they can do this when you provide a stability on that patient and achieve that. Uh, so, so I think the value here is really trying to imagine what these guys can achieve and, and what we can achieve to help them get there. Uh, a little bit more in that kind of patients. And I thought I'd show you, you know, in in the last few years, we've done 30 or so of these cases. These are our 30 experience. You know, the average age of patient is pretty old. They're, they're 78 or so, but there's some that are not as old. The lowest range is around 70. Most of them have left main. 83% of them have more than 50% left main. The EF is generally not great. And we have an algorithm that specifically addresses who requires ECMO support or not. We chose a few on Impella here, but our approach generally is to use ECMO. It's cheaper. Uh, we, we just did the logistics of organizing, trying to make sure we have the right guys to get in the room and get it done um, and, and do what is required. These patients, we try to stabilize prior to. These are not uh, emergent, crashing, doing CPR, doing this, and trying to get a good outcome. But even in those patients, if you look at the outcome, you know the 30-day mortality is still 10% for that group. These are not well people, um, but you know, 90% of them are discharged home and 70% of them are alive at one year. These are what we felt were very high risk, inoperable people. Is this a reasonable option for them? We think it is. Um, and this is something we're, we're thinking of obviously pursuing and really trying to be as selective as we can as we think about this and think about this disease in general. So. Hopefully, I, I've tried to convince you that, you know, cabbage over, over PCI for a large proportion of left main stenosis is really a class one indication. But PCI is or and appears to be safe in selected patients with left main stenosis. 
and it's just one other tool in your armamentarium of trying to deal with these patients. Um, it does highlight the need for heart team and the heart team discussion is just not rubber stamping things, is being really honest to yourself about what you think and what your colleague thinks is the best approach. And it's okay to disagree. Uh, you just need to, you know, not don't feel so strongly about your convictions and you're likely gonna come to a solution. Uh, and when high-risk PCIs are considered, I think con collaboration could really help achieve the best results. And this is where we really trying to push things for us and our team here. Anyways, I will stop there and, uh, whoops, stop sharing. Hopefully I can stop share. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Laguerre. Um, I'll ask the audience to hold their questions and we'll um, move on to our third and final talk of the evening with Dr. Yanagawa and then uh, leave some time at the end for some questions for those who can stay past the hour. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Um, in the interest of the hour, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes or so because I know you have things to do, as do I. So let's talk. But And, and mine is uh, quite simple. Let me see if I can do this. So those are wonderful talks by Sabod and uh, JF, uh, really applicable to your examinations and, uh, and also to the patients that you see every day. So I'm gonna talk on a little bit of a lighter topic. It's really about diversity in Canadian cardiac surgery and some of the things that we've been doing at St. Michael's Hospital uh, in collaboration with our team, with our division at uh, U of T and with the CSCS uh, EDI task force. So it's a bit of a lighter talk, you know, nothing to study about. Okay, so um, 2004, 2005, um, I came back to Canada from, I was in the UK, Cardiff, Wales, doing a postdoc. And um, this is actually a, a nice picture of the residency group at the time, David Ladder, who is an outstanding, who's really our uh, sort of master surgeon at St. Michael's Hospital. Uh, he was a program director and you see a wonderfully diverse group of, of gentlemen, um, but uh, really uh, no ladies. So um, diverse in, in ethnically and the like, but um, there was a lack of diversity in terms of gender. So that that's striking. And then if you look at, you know, I'm at St. Michael's Hospital. It's a downtown uh, inner city hospital in Toronto. We do 1,200 cases. We're quite a large center. And these are all the surgeons that we've had in the history of our organization. You know, again, like very diverse in terms of ethnicity and and the like, but you say, well, we've, we've never had a, like never had a single woman heart surgeon at St. Michael's. I mean, this is a, um, this is a bigger problem. This is a big problem. So this is the issue. And, and a similar thing can be said about every organization across the country. It's some gender diversity is one of the things that we really have to work on. And to some other extent, ethnic diversity. So uh, fast forward uh, today, these are the residents um, at the University of Toronto. Um, you can see, um, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a much better job in terms of gender, di gender diversity, and we're still ethnically quite diverse, which is reflective of our, of the patient population that we, we, um, we treat, but this is just the trainees. And, uh, the, really the issue is, um, how can we support, well, two things, how can we support women getting staff positions in the country? And then the second issue is, uh, we still are um, lacking in terms of some ethnic diversity in terms of Black and Indigenous uh, peoples represented heart surgery. So um, here's a little bit of a graphic here. Um, we've never had more than 10% women, uh, female or women, heart surgeons in Canada. Uh, we've only had one Indigenous heart surgeon in Canada, that was Donna uh, who was on staff, uh, trained in Canada, on staff at Newfoundland, but has now gone back to Cleveland Clinic uh, to pursue a staff position there. So we're back down to zero. And in the history of the entire country, not just today, but in the history of the country, we've in fact never had a black heart surgeon um, as in a staff position, which is shocking and something that we should address. So um, a couple of years ago or a year ago, um, uh, uh, you know, talking with Sabod and and uh, and then talking with uh, Rakesh Arora at the time, we said we really should have sort of an, uh, a declaration for the CSCS. And GF at the time was involved, and as was uh, Ansar Hassan, who's the current president, and a number of others. So we came up with a declaration of values and visions, and really uh, what we hope to be a living document for heart surgery in Canada to say, where are we, where are our challenges, and where do we have to go? 
So it's pretty similar to other uh, vision statements yeah, and, and really has the strategies that the usual strategies that you know of really about uh, representation, mentorship, um, really focusing on diversity in terms of conference presentations and online material, uh, having implicit bias training, both for surgeons and for referring cardiologists and for even for patients, and maybe even having a parallel woman in surgery group, uh, which we've seen in other jurisdictions and has been very successful. So I just want to show you, you know, sort of where we are and how we're making some progress, both at U of T and then nationally. And uh, maybe it might stimulate some ideas that you have at your own institution, and maybe you want to contribute and, and help uh, join our, our initiatives, all of which are good. So the next surgeon program, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So again, we said, well, Jesus, there's just no black heart surgeons in the country. How can we... Uh, how can we support this? But we said, well, there's not very many black medical students. So we got to go a little bit further back. So we ended up doing a real interesting pilot project uh, with uh, Toronto Community Housing, which is low subsidized housing in, in, the, in the city. And we got 22, uh, 23 kids uh, high school at the high school level. Uh, all 20 of 22 were women, by the way. That wasn't planned. That just happened. And most of them were hijabi and the like. And we brought them into the to St. Michael's Hospital during the pandemic, and they they learned about heart surgery and they got mentorship. And all of the people teaching were uh, black, so um, you could see Akachuku, who's a medical student, was giving a, a talk. We had a, a anesthesiologist from Cameroon, and um, uh, we had uh, one of our, our surgical fellows from Saudi. Uh, who was uh, not black, but was Middle Eastern, and also hijabi, give a talk. So everything is about representation. It was a wonderful, wonderful pro program. Um, it was really well received. Uh, it was uh, written up in the CBC, both on uh, um, internet and on radio. And I think it was that kind of hit a chord and, and really people said, this is the type of program that we really need. Next year in January, we're going to have our second iteration of the next surgeon program. We've already received over 90 kids that are interested in joining, and it's going to involve heart surgery, neurosurgery, and emergency medicine. And we hope to keep growing it and, uh, and inspire more kids along the way. And just to keep in mind, these are kids who are working class. You know, no one in their family, no one in their family or friends is, is a doctor. So we're trying to give them some tools and and, and inspire them to say, yeah, you can actually do this as well. Uh, part of the program is actually about surgical simulations. We actually get them to do coronary anastomoses, which is a lot of fun. So the second thing is, uh, you know, how do you get um, uh, young ladies and uh, how do you get uh, uh, maybe uh, underrepresented minorities into heart surgery? One of the things is you got to do research in the laboratory, but uh, sometimes it's pretty hard, you know, like if you if you got to work uh, as a medical student at the uh, uh, to make some money for the family or the like, it's very hard to do um, um, to do research in a laboratory. So we decided to host scholarships. So last year, I uh, managed to scrounge up some money. We got some wonderful sponsors, Medtronic and Abbott and and the University Faculty of Medicine at University of Toronto. So we got a few dollars and each scholarship was actually about $7,000. So that's not bad. That actually puts the financial pressure off the folks to say, yeah, you can now focus on this research. Uh, you have some money to pay your rent and the food and the like. And, uh, and that gives you that next step to get into a laboratory, publish some papers and then get into heart surgery. So we had two scholarships for women and one for black and indigenous students. And I think it was really successful. The the the, uh, the students really got something to kick out of it. And we'll see how many we can do this year. I just hope to have six or seven, but it really depend on how many dollars we can get. So um, we're thinking we're so the other thing that we're doing is resident EDI training at the University of Toronto. Um, I had taken a course called the Sanyas course, which is really about indigenous the indigenous experience. And I tell you, I learned a lot. You know, I was educated in this country, but I knew nothing about this residential school system, nothing about what Indigenous people went through. I knew nothing, almost nothing about it. Um, and uh, I went through this uh, online course. It took a couple of days, but it was really moving. And we just made it mandatory for our residents to undergo uh, some education about Indigenous health and the experience of Indigenous people. And we hope to kind of through these courses, a lot of which are online and, and pretty reasonably priced to educate our, our residents. And we hope 
then grow it to the residents across the country so that you can really be leaders. Now, if you want to be a leader in this country, you got to understand this kind of stuff. I mean, it's just mandatory because, you know, you're going to be leading your team, taking care of diverse populations, really, really important. So education, very important. Um, we've been also doing, you know, as you as you know, there are, are uh, pockets of communities and, and groups of uh, communities that are particularly susceptible uh, or at higher risk of cardiovascular disease. And uh, so we started doing talks in the Toronto community. Uh, one of our uh, medical students happened to be Igbo, which is one of the, the second largest tribe in Nigeria. Uh, and, and in that community, there's rampant hypertension. So there's, and it's a real concern um, uh, amongst that population. So we did some simple talks about heart health and about hypertension management and, and, and also just to try to demystify what heart surgery is. Because if you look at these populations, there's uh, there's a lot of hypertension, there's a lot of cardiac risk factors, but the utilization of heart surgery is actually quite low. So you say, well, what the heck's going on? It must be an, a, an issue of access and sometimes there's some cultural bias. So we want to educate people on you know, uh, what heart surgery is, how can it be helpful to people, and then try to ensure that they have access to it. Uh, we, we're going to go back to this Igbo community. There was about 40 or it was, it was about 70 people from the community in that center. They were really interested in the education and uh, no one had any blood pressure cuffs. So I'm trying to find uh, a way to get cheap blood pressure cuffs on Alibaba. Um, I found that I can get them for about $7 as opposed to, uh, you know, sort of $40 at the Shoppers Drug Mart. So I'm trying to get cheap blood pressure cuffs and get, get a few dollars together and, and bring blood pressure cuffs to the community center so they can just have them. Uh, and so that's not a barrier. So we're doing some innovative stuff. We're, we're trying. It's just really step by step. And, and um, uh, But I think the community is actually responding uh, well to that. Oh, that's right. Next talk is about blood pressure monitoring. And we're actually, I'm going to partner with a local Ebo family doctor. So again, it's about um, representation um, uh, when you do these talks. Um, so I'll talk to you, you know, everything that we do or I do is sort of, I would say sort of experimental. We just try things. Some of them work and some of them don't work. So um, one of the ladies that's part is a resident at UBC and is part of our EDI task force. Uh, her name's Rosalind Gronwald, was part of Team Canada. She was represent Canada as a snowboarder. And she said to us, she said, listen, what we did at Team Canada was we said we want to use only minority, black, indigenous providers for our catering and for um, AV and that. So so we thought that was kind of an interesting idea. And so I proposed to our residence RPC committee, our residency program committee, that we would, and you know, we spent a lot of money on food. We spent like 20, 30,000 a year. So I said, we're gonna spend 50% of our money on minority, what we said, black and indigenous owned businesses. That's catering and restaurants and the like. So, um, so that's what we tried. We, we, we tried this and, uh, but I must tell you uh, in all honesty, it was actually pretty unsuccessful. So try as I might, we looked around the downtown core and you, we want, we host a lot of journal clubs and dinners at restaurants, but we always need a, a, a private room and we couldn't find one for the, for the life of me. So, um, we, we just couldn't do it. You know, we have, we have hundreds of restaurants in downtown core and none of them have had the resources that we needed. So I guess they're just example of of the discrepancy in the in the restaurant industry. But uh, it's something that we try to do. We were unsuccessful, so you know uh, we'll move on. We'll, but we'll keep trying these kind of initiatives and do the best we can. So as I said before, only ten percent of female heart surgeons in Canada are uh, women. And this, this is a paper that uh, um, uh, Maria Servito and Morrell and Jen Chung and I published in uh, JTCVS short paper in 2022. So this is in Canada. If you look over the years, now the green line is staff surgeons. You say, well, the staff surgeons haven't really budged, but it, the blue and red lines are the trainees. So we've actually been training like 40% women for uh, over a decade but the staff numbers have not increased. So we, this is strange, like the, the pipeline is leaky. So, you know, we're kind of looking at why this is, some of us may have a sense of what it is, but no one's really studied it uh, systematically. 
Now, it's a sensitive area. You know, why are people not getting jobs? It's a kind of a sensitive question. So sometimes you don't get the right real answer. Sometimes it's difficult. It seems to be a pattern. It's a pattern that's kind of concerning. So I think it's something that we should be looking at and to try to understand what what is underlying this 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 problem, this leaky pipeline. As I mentioned, uh, CSCS um, in its leadership uh, started with Rakesh Aurora, now with Ansar Hassan. We decided to have a e an EDI task force, and I'm I'm heading the task force, and um, really pleasure to work with Janet New and Newfoundland. They're going to have a brand new heart center out there. She's excited. Marina Ibrahim, who trained with us and is just an outstanding aortic surgeon in the Montreal area, uh, Therese Servito in Winnipeg, and Rosalind Grunwald in Vancouver. So it's a small group. We're some residents, some staff, and we're trying to make some changes. And if anyone here is interested, we'd be delighted to have you join. So uh, a few things that we're going to do initially in our first year is a spotlight on women and roundtable discussion. We're going to update the State of the Union, that paper that we had in, C in the CCS, uh, sorry, CJC. Um, the CSCS has a podcast series, uh, and we'd like to contribute to that. And we are thinking about starting a women in surgery mentorship program. Um, but we want to make sure that's really going to be something successful. So we're trying to be thoughtful about that. Um, so um, Sabod Verma is my surgical mentor and academic mentor. And um, he really pushed for this. He, he said, you guys have to have something in the top academic cardiology, cardiac surgery uh, journal, uh, uh, really highlighting this issue. And so myself and uh, Marina Ibrahim from uh, McGill and uh, Jennifer Lawton, who's the uh, division head Johns Hopkins, came out with this uh, really kind of short but elegant paper uh, called Women in Cardiac Surgery, Closing the Equity Gap. And, um, you know, I will tell you that there was some uh, resistance to have a man write a paper about women in cardiac surgery. But, you know, I think uh, this issue needs allies, just like any other issue needs allies. And uh, so I think it's apropos. Um, um, uh, but uh, this, this paper highlights some of the major challenges and makes it aware, makes cardiologists aware, because there is a bias to having women heart surgeons, and sometimes cardiologists are the cause of it. So for them to get the education to realize that, you know, we better treat male heart surgeons and women heart surgeons just the same is real important. And then we uh, had a wonderful podcast actually at the last CSCS meeting in Montreal. So uh, I'm kind of here in the middle and I'm, I'm surrounded by some fantastic surgeons, having to be women, um, uh, Jessica Forsillo and Marina Ibrahim in Montreal, again, Janet New in Newfoundland, and a couple of residents, uh, Veronica and Charlotte at uh, Ottawa and uh, uh, McMaster. And we had a, and my student, um, uh, Ali, is in the side there. And we had a wonderful discussion and, and not really focusing on, you know, again, not like sort of, you know, it's hard to be a woman and this and that. But to celebrate the success, you know, for for Silo and Ibrahim are just incredible stars in our field. So to celebrate the success, and then also talk about the challenges and like, um, uh, but this want to balance this sort of the message, uh, mostly about you know really providing these ladies can be uh, mentors to the next generation and their wonderful wonderful successes in our field. Um, uh, part about getting the message across is again working with different groups. So. Um, I worked, uh, I, I gave a talk to uh, Abbott. They have a woman leaders of Abbott and they're, you know, the industry is very, very advanced in this field. Uh, so uh, we shared experiences and shared tactics. And, you know, just like we work in industry and device um, our research and utilization, we can work it with industry in the area of EDI. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, it's a short talk. I didn't want to dwell too much as late. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, my email's there. Uh, this is my daughter who wants to be a heart surgeon uh, in Halloween. She wanted to be a heart surgeon. And of course, um, you know, what kind of uh, what kind of message do I want to say that I want to have a, a field that's going to be more supportive of my son than my daughter? Well, I don't want that. You know, obviously, I want to, I want a field that's going to be uh, equally as supportive to both my son and my daughter. And uh, that's what we're looking towards. Uh, but if you have any, if you want to contribute, partic participate, uh, send me an email and we'll work together. Thanks so much.
Huge thank you to our three speakers for this evening. Um, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm conscious that we're now at 8.15, so we're 15 minutes over time. I think most people will probably want to get home and eat dinner. Um, if it's okay with the three speakers, perhaps people with questions could contact you, send an email rather than extending the session tonight, and we'll let every, everyone go and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.